Um, our, our next speaker is a friend of mine, a new friend, Eliza Strickland. She is, as I said earlier, the outgoing co-chair of Durham Special Needs Advisory Council. This is a group of strong parents who are making a difference in our community. And so I look forward to hearing what she has to say. Thank you so much, Krista, for that introduction. And I wanna introduce again, um, Sumitra Porter, who is our incoming chair. So you've caught us right um, after an election and before the sort of official changeover. So, um, so I'm gonna be um, giving, doing most of the talking tonight, but wanted to make sure that y'all know that uh, Sumitra is here and um, ready to step up. We're very excited about that. Um, next slide, please. So who is DSNAC? Um, the Durham Special Needs Advisory Council. We are a parent-led group. We were formed um, around 2016 um, to provide a voice for families with students receiving EC services within DPS. Um, and our mission is to collaborate um, with education professionals as well as community members to support and improve the outcomes for students with special needs um, in Durham Public Schools. So we are um, specific to DPS and um, open to um, parents and guardians whose students are attending DPS and who have an IEP or a 504 plan, um, as well as open to um, professionals within DPS and um, community partners like some of the groups that are here tonight. Um, and uh, you can go ahead to the next slide, please. We do also have a, a line of communication that has been extremely um, helpful to us and very open on, on both sides um, to some of the leadership within DPS. So um, we have an executive committee that kind of advises us um, and that we meet with regularly and that includes the officers of DSNAC who are all parents, um, as well as Dr. Bell, um, Suzanne Cotterman, who's the director of um, early education and um, Frederick Raven, who is now a member of the school board and who was our immediate past um, chair of DSNAC and one of the co-founders as well. Next slide, please. So just to try to give you an idea of some of the things that we've been doing lately. Um, right now, we're really trying to focus on building awareness and connections. Um, and some of the ways that we're doing that is we're trying to strengthen our presence um, at the school level across DPS. We've been building a Disability Awareness Week toolkit that schools can share that's been piloted at um, one school and then we're um, putting that together and planning to be able to share that out um, so that parents can help get that started at their school if that's something they're interested in or we've had teachers from um, a school who've gone to a different school and said, hey, you know, we want some of those resources that you guys were using for Disability Awareness Week. So that way this can kind of travel with whoever wants to use it. Um, We've also been working to build a network of parent representatives in schools who can help to um, increase the awareness around students with special needs in their school, build connections with other families at that school, and just kind of help information flow um, from the families at the school towards DSNAC and the district, and as well as helping to kind of push information from DSNAC and from the district about resources um, or changes um, help to share that with people at their school so that they that might include you know going to PTA meetings um, sharing things on your school's Facebook group it's not a it's not a huge time commitment but um, it just kind of helps improve communication across the district and um, get us all connected to each other next slide please um, another project that we're doing right now is um, a partnership with 
UNC's Community Equity Data and Information Lab, so the SETI lab, um, to try to make information um, more accessible online about EC services. So um, that group has made some recommendations in partnership with um, DPS for some suggestions about the DPS website, the information that's available there. They're also working to build a um, new website uh, to provide information about EC services in Durham, as well as some resources for families and for teachers even um, that will be on that site, which I'm, I'm excited about. Um, so to help us with that, we would love it if you could take our survey and let us know what kind of information you're looking for that you haven't been able to find or that you'd like to see more of. Um, and there will be a link to that um, at the end of the presentation, I think. So we can move to the next slide. Um, so I would really encourage you to join us if you're um, involved with DPS and if you're here tonight, then you're um, definitely someone we would like to have. Um, you can get on our email list and um, you can follow us on Facebook as well. And um, I think the next slide will have a link to the survey. Um, and also would love to encourage you to um, be a school rep at your child's school. Um, just shoot us an email, let us know what school it is. And we can, if we already have someone at that school, we can connect you. Um, but um, yes, I'm just, I'm excited to be able to be a part of this tonight and very grateful to Durham County for putting this on. Um, it's been a little bit overwhelming as a parent led organization to try to do all the, the things that we would normally like to be doing around this time one of which is um, having a presentation with Dr. Bell. And so this was, this was the perfect synergy for us. Um, we're glad to be a part of it. So thank you. Thank you so much, Eliza. And thank you, Sumitris, too, for being here with us. And we'll get to hear from both of you during your Q&A. Um, we're, we're also so proud to have your organization within our community. It's such an asset. Um, we're going to say last but not least on our presenters tonight, um, another wonderful new friend, Jenna Meehan, um, who brings the fun to everything. She's going to tell us about all the awesome fun things that um, we have at our Durham County Library. Thank you, Krista. Um, so I am Jenna Meehan. Um, I use the pronouns she, her. I am the Special Needs Services Coordinator for Durham County Library. Um, this is a part-time position that um, the library established about a year and a half ago, and I really have been so excited just to bring different ideas, hear from the community, and um, just have the ability to provide more access for resources and materials for students and people with disabilities. Um, uh, a little bit about me, I am also an occupational therapist. I'm um, a parent of a DPS EC student and a community member of Durham. So I'm very um, passionate about our, our city and I love being a part of our community. Um, next slide please, Krista. So um, I'm sharing just a couple quick things that the library has um, has that I'm not sure if there's as much um, knowledge about, but it's it's really amazing resources that we have. Um, if you're familiar with Boardmaker, it if you're not familiar with it, it is a um, visual aid um, customizable software. So um, you can make picture schedules, choice boards. Um, it can be um, help facilitate AAC, augmentative and alternative communication. Um, and really there's so many things you can do with it. Um, recently I've made sight words using the first grade curriculum vocabulary, make for bingo sheets. Um, so many different things you can do with it. So the library owns five copies of the Boardmaker software, which are on five different laptops. So when the library was open to the public, um, you were able to contact me and reserve a time where you were able to access and use the, the software. Um, right now, since um, the library 
is closed to the public. Um, you're still able to use the Boardmaker software. It's just a little different. You can email me. Um, my email is at the bottom and um, just request what you need. And I'm able to make the board maker visual aids for you and I can send them directly to you in a PDF document. Or if you'd rather have them printed, I can print them um, to be picked up at a library takeout location. Um, unfortunately, it's a little hard to be able to know all the amazing things board maker can do because there's really so many. Um, but if you think you want something and you're not sure what, just please email me and I'm happy to go over different options of what is available. Um, next slide, please. Um, so an idea that I, I have, because I have um, been interested in neurodiversity, um, probably in the movement, um, which is basically that um, brains are all different and autism, ADHD, dyslexia um, are all variants of um, brain diversity. So um, I started this book club, the Neurodiversity Book Club last July. And on the left side of the slide are some of the books that we've um, read together as a group. And um, just the conversations that have come from this group. Um, there have been DPS teachers, therapists, um, psychologists, um, parents, so many different perspectives with so many different um, experiences. And I think just having these resources to come together as a community in a supportive, safe space, um, using our, our, our public library is a really powerful and um, special thing and I'm so proud to be able to facilitate it and just the knowledge that I've learned has been amazing so I'm really I'm really excited to continue this we're doing it virtually now the the book we're reading currently is um, the book at the top all the weight of our dreams on living radicalized autism um, and we have our next meeting on Monday if anyone's interested feel free to join our zoom we'd love to have you um, and, and also, if, you, if you're interested in it, but not sure if you can make it, please um, email me. I'm, I would love any questions about it. Next slide, please, Krista. And finally, um, this is something new that the library is going to offer. And I think it's going to be a really um, helpful resource. We're going to have sensory kits that are going to be available for people to check out for three weeks at a time. Um, the sensory kits are going to be a collection of items, um, including fidgets, um, pencil grips. Um, what else do we have? Noise canceling headphones. I have a whole list, but we have, we have a lot of things in each kit. Um, so you're able to check them out, use them as you need. Um, and I think it's just a really great way to see if some if there's um, a tool that you or your child or someone in your family um, might be able to use as a means for self-regulation without the commitment to have to purchase it and kind of um, just see if this is something that's that's helpful and um, can be a resource that everyone's able to access. So again, for this, this is something that um, if you're interested, email me and um, I will be happy to um, get it checked out to y'all and coordinate the pickup. And that's all for me. Thank you so much, Jenna. So we are going to open the floor to questions now. Um, Luden's going to put the instructions again about how to, how to do that. But I actually see we have some questions that have come in while we've been talking. So the first one is, um, I'm guessing for Kristen Bell, Dr. Kristen Bell, um, how does a parent get access to these assessment results and EOC results? Great question. You should definitely contact your child's school. Those are things that should be put in their cumulative file. So I don't know if the contact person um, always start with the classroom teacher. It might be the school counselor. That That's your point of contact to get that. But you should have access to even the um, any information around universal screeners, any tests or assessments that are given, you should be able to request directly from the school. 
Great, thank you. Um, we also have a couple of questions about getting these, these slides. Um, and I will tell you that I posted them online before we started and forgot to tell you where they are, <laughs> but they are on our website and I will have ask Luton to, to put that link in the um, chat as well. So you can get a copy of the slides there on our website. Um, I also see that we have a hand raised here, Abner H. Um, so Luden, would you go ahead and let Abner speak? Hi, so um, I'm seeing an issue because it says that Abner um, does not have the right version of Zoom. So an option is to promote him to panelist. Um, All right, let's do it. Let's make Abner a panelist. I'll, I'll do it. I'll go ahead and do it for you. All right, Abner, you are now a panelist. <laughs> Tell us what you want to know. <laughs> oh, he's still on mute. It's still muted, yeah. Could still be an issue with the um, with the version of Zoom that Abner has. We'll we'll keep we'll keep talking and we'll we'll see what happens with Abner there. Abner, speak up whenever if you are able to. Um, in the interim, I have a question now for someone. I'm guessing this is probably for DSNAC or ECAC. Um, so what resource or recourse, sorry, do parent, families have if services that are in their IEP are not currently being offered? You want me to do that? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, as Dr. Bell shared, um, IEPs need to still be followed um, and, and unless there is, a, you know, that virtual, the thing with the other letters that is uh, currently in place. But um, we, we've been hearing from quite a lot of parents, not necessarily right here in Durham, but across the state where either it's technical or there's not a lack of staff, there's any number of reasons that services aren't getting to children. And so the best thing to do for right now as a parent is, is to keep track. Um, Whatever works for you, it doesn't have to be a formal system, but whatever you can do to keep track of how, what services are, are, are happening, which ones are not on a daily basis, and, and keep that communication coming, like, like the um, Dr. Bell's presentation said. Keep that communication coming to the teacher, to the people in the special ed department if you need to, to the principal if you need to. And... Ultimately, in the long run, if services have not been provided, there will be some sort of time, we don't know when, where it kind of all gets um, settled out in some way. There's a, a thing called compensatory services that you'll, you'll be in a conversation about. We don't know, again, we don't know when we're going to have to, everybody's doing the best they can to sort that all out. But there is the concept that if, they, if services were missed, that they can be made up, not necessarily minute to minute or hour to hour, but in some kind of a way. So you do have recourse and you won't have as much recourse if you don't keep track. So uh, be prepared to keep communicating and then get involved in those conversations. Um, I'm gonna guess, and maybe Dr. Bell can confirm this, by the end of the school year, they're gonna be the school districts will want to sort this out and possibly even use that time in the summer um, to to uh, square up with with kids for what they might have missed. That's perfect, Karen. And I would add to that, at least in Durham Public Schools, I would say um, get in touch with someone as soon as possible when you feel that's happening rather than like, and, and that's that list if it's the EC teacher and you don't, you know, you need to go down the list. If you get to me, and I hear that parents say their child is not getting services, I'm going to take action, we're going to find out what's going on and problem solve. Um, and you're right, Karen, there are, there are some situations that are out of out of our control and we're keeping track, right, where we've got some schools that um, don't have staff, right, or they don't have the full staff to fully implement IEPs. Um, so we would be keeping track on our end too about what do we need to make up. And in the summer is a time that we're looking at. Um, hopefully we'll, <laughs> Far before then, we'll be able to do some in-person stuff, but definitely, hopefully, by summer to make up for some of these changes that have occurred because of. Thank you both. Um, 
This is a question for Jenna regarding sensory kits from the library. What kind of safety measures are we taking to make them safe for checkout after someone else has returned them? Thank you. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, so any materials, including books, DVDs, anything that's coming into the library um, after public use is being quarantined for 72 hours. Um, following that, we have a procedure to clean all the equipment. Um, everything is going to be thoroughly cleaned. The only thing that we are including in the sensory kits is um, a small container of Play-Doh. And because that's not going to be able to be cleaned as thoroughly, everyone's allowed to keep their Play-Doh. Um, but thank you for that question. That's great. Um, and then I have a question, this one is for Kim. What services are provided for adults with autism in Spanish? Thank you, also thank you. <laughs> Uh, so I think frozen. that one's for you, Kim. Can you get, okay, are you able to come off mute? Looks like she may be frozen. We'll make, we'll come back to that one in a second. Oh, there she's unfrozen. She was frozen. For a <laughs> Kim, can you hear me? I can hear you now, but it okay. is, it has frozen on me a couple of times. Yeah, I could see that you were frozen. Um, so the question for you was, what services are provided for adults with autism in Spanish? It would probably be best for the caller to um, give us a call so we can figure out, you know, what those services can be. But we do offer from um, some supported employment. It just it does depend on, um, you know, what the, what kind of insurance somebody has if they're on Medicaid. Uh, but through Mariella, if it's somebody who only speaks Spanish. Um, we're able to really help get them connected to other great Hispanic resources um, and the same kind of thing, looking at support and employment. Um, there's job tips. Uh, is it somebody who may be more significantly, you know, their needs a little bit higher and um, we need to look at what type of waiver or state funded services might be available. So that's what we're here is to help um, families kind of tweak all that out so we can help them figure out what their options are. Awesome, thank you, Kim. And mm -hmm. I noticed that Luden put the information, uh, contact information into the chat for them. So great, that's thank great. you. Um, I have three more questions. I know we're out of time, so let's try to get through them really fast because I do want to answer everyone's questions. Um, I think this is probably for Symmetris or for um, Eliza, if one of y'all want to try this one. Um, so someone is saying, um, I'll just read it. We have these long IEP meetings to review the plan for my child. The plan is worried, worded in a difficult way to follow. They say parents get to have a say in the IEP, but how does that actually happen? I don't feel like I can shape the IEP at all. That's a, probably a very long answer, I know, but from parents who have experience with this, could y'all help a little bit? <laughs> yeah, I... Um... I'm sorry, first of all, that that is the feeling that you're having. It can, I can relate to that feeling from my earliest days. I think things have improved for, for us recently. Um, I would probably actually refer that to Karen or even to Dr. Bell. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, so I'm really glad, Eliza, that you said that. Um, so you, you, the question you asked is, this is what we do. So I were out there. The reason I took this job is I felt like that. So we have time to just talk it through with you. Sometimes we'll, we'll ask you if you don't mind sharing the actual IEP and we'll kind of look at it together and kind of figure out like, what are your questions about it? What would help you understand it better? You got to understand it when you're home thinking about school, you should be able to picture what's happening. And you should be able to picture how you know if it's, if the plan is helping your child the way it, it, it needs to. And if you're not feeling like that and your friends are not feeling like that, please do share our information. Please do contact us. We'd love to. This is a, just what we're out there to do. Thank you so much. That's really helpful. Um, so I'm going to do one more. I know we're out of time, but one more question, then we'll, we'll finish. Um, so this is a question for Dr. Bell again. Um, if a child has a written IEP, what steps can be taken to include OT services through DPS 
if originally they were being provided through a private establishment. Jenna, you should take that one. You're the OT. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a great question. If I think if you um, feel that your child needs OT, they've got it privately, um, you can, um, if, and they already have an IEP, you can ask for an, an early reevaluation for OT to be considered as a need. You would definitely want to share the evaluations that you already have had done privately and what services are your child is receiving. And then the IEP team would meet under an early reevaluation to consider that information, look at all the data and see if your child would qualify and be in need of um, school-based OT services. Um, which, and there is a difference sometimes, right, Jenna, and you can speak to this, differences between private OT and school-based OT and the purposes behind them. And Jenna, Jenna, I'll defer to you to even elaborate on that because I know you know that. Yeah, we have different criteria um, to be able to qualify for school-based OT versus um, a medically-based occupational therapy services. Um, so yeah, I would follow what Dr. Bell also said. But yeah, if, if your child was receiving private occupational therapy and you still feel like there's issues that are um, impacting their ability to attend and, and learn and access their environment, I would definitely contact their um, team and, re and request the occupational therapy evaluation. Thank you both. So I'm getting begging email, begging private chats to continue with these last two questions. So I'm gonna do it and y'all can just hang up on me if you want, but <laughs> so um, this one says, my son is nearly 18 years old. I have finally scheduled an appointment with his pediatrician to re request a referral for a diagnosis. Although his longtime, um, sorry, although his longtime pediatrician prescribed medication for several years, a diagnosis was never made outside of the school psychologist. Um, his cumulative files have labeled him as ADHD on the autism spectrum. I never realized the word autism was actually there until last year. What do you suggest I do if he is officially diagnosed? Is it too late to help my son? Will he have to navigate through this process on his own? And Kim is ready to answer. Thank you, I Kim. am. <laughs> Please call us. <laughs> We'd love to help talk you through that. Um, if it is that we need to make sure that he gets um, you know, a diagnosis, he is 18. And so as you know, he's gonna be entering to be his own guardian, which is wonderful. Um, but it's making sure that he's got the, the tools in place and that um, there really are some great options um, that we can help connect him to and you to, and um, we'll be there to walk beside you through that, that process. So please, please connect. Mm, thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. Again, your empathy just comes through comes through the, the Zoom. Um, so I have a final question, and this is for Dr. Bell, but I actually know it's something Jenna is excited about too. So um, Dr. Bell, what conversations are currently occurring in addressing the inability of a major number of EC kids unable to use masks or other wearable equipment due to sensory issues um, for in-school instruction? Thank you. Oh, we're going to end on that question, huh? That's a good one. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, so I don't have a definitive answer on that. I know that that those are conversations that are currently happening as we're planning for this plan B in in person return. Um, and we just um, there's a policy that's drafted, right? So nothing's been finalized. Things will have to go to the school board. Um, we've been finding out what are other districts doing. How are they handling that? Um, looking at what the CDC is, is recommending, but then locally, what do you want to do and how do you handle that? Um, that's complicated. And um, I think there's a lot that goes into that. We want to, we definitely want to make sure that all of our kids have access and can be served safely and effectively at school. Um, and we don't want to have anything in place that's going to exempt students without it absolutely being a necessity and having to, them to remain on remote where we know most of our, a lot of our kids are really struggling. Um, so there, I don't, I can't commit to anything right now, but I do, I do promise you that that is being very thoroughly discussed and thoughtfully discussed. Um, and EC is at the table representing because we know, we know our students and we know there's a lot of variability and reasons why students may not be able to wear masks. Um, so we will be, um, we will be working on that. Um, I'm sorry that I don't have an answer for you now, but I, I would definitely say stay tuned when information gets rolled out and in, in more comprehensively across the board about our plan B, you'll hear more about that. But that's a great, very complicated question. Yeah. 
Well, thank you all so much. I have one more that says not a question, but a big appreciation for all your time and helpful responses. Thank you. And that's certainly how I feel as well. Um, it's so wonderful to have you all as resources for our community. Um, I see so many of my PFAS parents here tonight, and I know the struggles that they have, and it's just awesome to be able to, to address some of those tonight. So thank you so much.